Okay, hello. Um, this is, um, oddly, uh, it says section test one here, but it's section test two. I think I corrected that on the, uh, the final form that I posted to Moodle. Um, so this is your second test. It's due March 14th by 5 p.m. Um, and it's got a couple of things taken straight from the course syllabus um, section test. I followed the description very closely here. It's five short answer questions and one longer answer question. The short answer questions are worth two points each and the longer answer question is a 10 pointer. And this time it, as you sort of enter a debate about a dilemma, not even enter the dilemma, but have a debate about the dilemma given the theory um, from the course. Um, these, these tests are based on both the, the textbooks in question, um, which are three in this case, but they're piddly little skinny things here, um, and uh, all of the video material, my videos, the supplementary videos, and I actually ask you um, to engage with something in one of the Roderick videos. Um, so you should probably uh, screen those for this, this assignment. Of course, you should probably screen those anyway because they're required content. Um, so that's um, just what the section tests are, the missed assignment policy. Let me know either before the due date um, in question if you're going to miss it or within 12 hours. And, I, you know, I'm the first to understand that life happens. So um, it, I'll be more than happy to work with you in that kind of a situation. If you miss it by a long time um, and don't contact me, the idea is the extension requires a conversation. And um, I'm fairly forthcoming with these things, but nonetheless. Um, and uh, assignment submission, it's your responsibility to make sure the assignment is submitted properly, so double check yourself. And um, then finally, zero tolerance policy on plagiarism. Anything that you cite, if it's not your own words, needs a reference, so tell me where it came from. All right, so um, that's the point. If, if I'm looking for it, I should be able to go and find it. Uh, um, as I mentioned, there have been some issues with this, and that's why these policies are front and center. Okay, so readings. Uh, Kant's Grounding to the Metaphysic of Morals, um, Preface Sections 1 and 2, um, John Stuart Mill's Utilitarianism, um, Chapters 1, 2, and 3, and uh, John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, um, is the uh, first section. Um, and I do ask you questions about that. Video material, my, my can't video, um, uh, Michael Sandel's Justice, What's the Right Thing to Do, um, Episode 6, Mind Your Motive, um, Rick Roderick, Kant and the Path to Enlightenment, School of Life Philosophy, Kant, My Mill video, um, Utilitarianism and, and on Liberty, Michael Sandel, um, justice, what the th uh, what's the right thing to do, episode two, putting a price tag on life, that's where he goes through the cost-benefit analysis thing, and then Rick Roderick's Mill on Liberty, where he actually continues a debate between Kantian and utilitarian morality at the beginning of that video. Um, so um, you'll see that's, that's important here. So short answer questions, um, I, I'm giving you minimums here between three and five sentences for each. That's minimal, right? So um, if you give me less than three, you can't pass. That's the thing about minimums by sentences. I mean full sentences, not point form. Two points each, total 10 points for the short answer questions. Now, um, I should mention that this material, especially the camp material, is sort of a bugger, right? So um, it's, I'm acknowledging that I'm asking you to do something difficult here, so um, that'll be reflected in how I assess. Um, so, question one with Kant here. Kant argues in the preface to the grounding that a metaphysics of morals is necessary since, quote, uh, what is to be morally good? Uh, what, uh, what it is to be morally good that it conforms with the moral law is not it is not enough. Why does Kant argue this? Right. So that's right at page three of the preface. Um, in my video, I go into a brief discussion about this. Right. So um, this is the idea of 
duty that is in general terms appearing for its first time in uh, the grounding uh, the grounding and so um, it, it, what I want you to do is engage with this argument and I, I give you a walkthrough of this argument in my video so um, it's if you have questions please do let me know um, question number two, in his discussion of the first formulation of the categorical imperative, and I give it to you, act only according to that maxim whereby you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law, can't draw a distinction between perfect and imperfect duties. Introduce the distinction between perfect and imperfect duties. All right, so um, there is a mechanism that in the video I go over for determining the distinction between a perfect and imperfect duty. Right? Um, Kant gives you four examples, uncharacteristically, because this has to be the clearest Kant that I've ever read. Um, but nonetheless, he gives you four examples, two of which of perfect duties, um, uh, the false promise, right? It's so telling, truth telling becomes a perfect duty. Um, and um, he gives you the example of somebody considering committing suicide. But um, it turns out we've got a perfect duty to preserve our own lives. Um, imperfect duties, um, helping others and um, d d developing our talents. You should sort of do this, but then, um, but nonetheless, there is a mechanism right in the wording of uh, act only in according to that maxim, whereby you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. Uh, there's there's a way that um, it, you can figure it out. One has to do with a, a, a rational contradiction and the other one has to do with the contradiction of the will for determining this. So, anyhow. All right. um, question number three. Kant introduces the humanity, the humanity principle. Act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of another, always as an end in itself and nearly, never merely as a means as another formulation of the categorical imperative. Actually, he argues that these formulations of the categorical imperative are just different ways of saying exactly the same thing. Um, uh, for a great discussion of this, the Michael Sandel Kant video, the Mind Your Motive video, actually goes into a beautiful, precise discussion of this issue exactly. Um, I do it in my video as well. All right. Um, this, princ uh, this principle, uh, the humanity principle, act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person, blah, 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 blah. This principle, he argues, rests on the dignity of human beings, which he, and he argues human beings are objects of respect. That's page 36 of your Kant. Why are human beings, according to Kant, objects of respect? Like I say, Sandel he's a superstar, right? He does a beautiful job of introducing this. So um, he's probably a huge asset for you in terms of addressing this, the fourth or the, the third question um, on this exam. So I did three Kant and two mil, right? Um, for the short answer questions. So Number four is um, the, the, just the basic distinction between Bentham's utilitarianism and Mill's utilitarianism, um, uh, which again, Sandel goes into um, and um, I go into on my video. So, um, and it is right at the beginning of um, the utilitarianism book. Mill modifies Bentham's initial position in two main respects. In the first, Mill finds it necessary to make a distinction between qualitative and quantitative analysis of pleasures. Discuss the, the principle of utility generally. Like, what's the principle of utility? Just tell me what the principle of utility is. Greatest good for the greatest number. Right. Um, and explain this distinction discussing why Mill argues that it is a, ne a necessary addition to utilitarian morality. Why is the quantitative quali qualitative distinction necessary according to Mill? Right. So 
Um, that's what I'm looking for for number four. Then, number five, your last short answer question. Mill discusses in On Liberty the, harm, uh, the principle of harm. Uh, so it's a fairly simple principle. Um, it, very early on in this first section, um, to do, to do, let me see. Where is it here? Here we go. Um, page nine. The object of this essay is to assert one very simple principle as entitled to govern absolutely in the dealings of society with the individual in the way of compulsion and control, whether the means be used uh, means used be physical force in the form of legal penalties or the moral coercion of public opinion. That principle is that the sole end for which mankind are warranted individually or collectively and in interfering with the liberty of action of any of their number is self-protection. More clearly, that the only purpose for which power can rightfully be exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. His own good, either physical or moral, is not sufficient warrant. He cannot rightfully be compelled to uh, do or forbear because it will be better for him to do so, because it will make him happier, because in the opinions of others to do so would be wise or even right. So that's the harm principle. Mill discusses in On Liberty the principle of harm. Beyond physical harm, Mill introduces three essential human liberties, violations of which would constitute harm. Introduce these liberties. How does the position... So it's your job is to introduce the liberties. Right. I will say Roderick does a beautiful job of distinguishing between harm and offense in his video, but interestingly, he overlooks the liberties. Here, we've got these three essential human liberties. If I violate these human liberties, I am harming you. So, right, it's, 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 it's fleshing out the full political value of the political liberty that Mill is trying to establish here. All right. Introduce these liberties. How does the position presented by Mill and on, on liberty relate to his general position in utilitarianism? And interestingly, for each of these human liberties, and again, Roderick does a good job of laying this out in his video. He presents a utilitarian argument in favor of each of these liberties, most clearly in terms of thought and discussion, but nonetheless. Right? So he's got good utilitarian reasons for establishing a realm of poli political liberty here. So um, turn to Roderick for this. I try to do a decent job of it in the, uh, the videos as well. So... Um, Roderick's a superstar, though, so I have to acknowledge that. So, um, those are your five short answer questions. Like I say, three or five sentences minimally in response for each. Um, so, anyhow, uh, part two, longer answer question. Um, so, three to five paragraphs in response. A paragraph consists of a minimum of three sentences. The goal for this section is to make a short argumentative account of the material at hand as directed by the question below. All right, one question, 10 points. And I present you with sort of a dilemma here, uh, which I import from um, Rick Roderick right, in his video, Mill on Liberty. So Rick Roderick begins his video, Mill on Liberty, with the following example to illustrate the reality of how muddy actual moral choices can be. I'll just read it quick here. A mayor of a small Greek village being occupied during the Second World, World War um, by the Nazis. Right. There are some resistance fighters in town, only three of them, but they shoot three German officers on the beach. So, the German officers decide to retaliate and they bring into the center of the square 
a, th a, a thousand of the women and children of the city and put them in this little encirclement. They captured the three resistance fighters and, of course, symbolically put them on three posts. Very nice. They bring uh, the mayor out, and I'm just quoting the transcript of um, Roderick's video here. They bring the mayor out and they give him the following choice. And you would think the moral theory would help us with this. They say, look, if you shoot the three in front of you, um, in front of your townspeople, then we'll let everybody out of the pen. So there's a good utilitarian thing you ought to do, right? Shoot them quick because that's three lives against a thousand. And the utilitarian calculation is simple. Shoot them for the greater good. Even though shooting them is wrong according to Kant, you do it because there is nothing else that you really can do. Do it, it's for the greater good. So the utilitarian principle looks overwhelming in this case. On the other hand, you might, uh, <clears throat> you might have the insight that you couldn't do it anyway. The Germans might shoot those three and the thousand, but you couldn't do it. Uh, that would be the Kantian insight. And I don't necessarily buy that that is the Kantian insight. It might actually look more like, you know, effectively you were doing something wrong for the greater good, which Mill tells you is right. So effectively Mill is telling you to, to do something wrong and that doing that something wrong is right. So Kant would, you know, bluntly reject uh, this calculation. Right, that's being presented by the Germans. Right? In terms of moral responsibility for the action, you are you have a perfect duty in the Kantian sense not to kill. Right? So effectively by refusing the entirety of the thing, right, what you would be doing is obeying your perfect duty to others. Right? So anyhow, um, it's it it's an ugly moral case, right? Recently, I've read a lot of literature about how, you know, frankly, we you know, obsess on these disgusting, barbaric moral cases in order to illustrate our understanding of, of ethics and that there might be something ethically wrong with this. But nonetheless, that's beside the point. This is the dilemma. Here's a mayor of a small Greek village being told to shoot these three people or the Germans are going to kill a thousand people. The utilitarian calculation seems simple, but Kant would say that there is no right way to do something wrong. Right. So there seems to be a debate between Kantian and utilitarian morality at the center of this uh, dilemma. Right. So Roderick presents this, uh, uh, this case to present uh, both Kantian and utilitarian moral, moral theory as models for moral theory rather than practical moral systems. Presenting brief summaries of Kantian and utilitarian moral principles, so just give me summaries. Would you argue that either moral theory is the superior theory to meet this case? Or do you agree with Roderick, who argues that moral choice, choice making is far more complex than either of these simplified systems can take into account? So we're sort of jumping off this example. This isn't a question about this example per se. It's about whether or not the moral theory that we've studied is adequate to meet such a case, or whether either of the moral systems, or whether both of the moral systems fail to actually engage with the reality of moral choice making. So um, this is a big sort of overview choice or overview question with regard to moral choice making by either of these systems. Right. So um, I should point out that there's there's not a right answer to this, right? It's I mean it's you're not being assessed in terms of get the right answer. No, you're incorrect. Utilitarian moral theory is the way to go. No, Kantian moral theory is the way to go. It's not it's not that kind of a question, right? The kind of question that it is is one that asks you to introduce the moral theories that we've studied and evaluate the both of them, asking yourself the question. Like, look, can I 
rely on a moral system to make these kinds of choices? Is there one of these moral systems that's superior to the other? Or do they both, insofar as their systems, fail? So um, that will uh, be the quiz, or the test, right? Um, if you have any questions about any of these questions, or about how you're being assessed, or what you're being asked to do, or about the theory itself, please, please, please contact me. I'm here to help. You succeed, I succeed, everybody does well, right? Um, so please engage with the class, engage me if you're in trouble, and um, then we will be in a better position to engage with one another about this material. I think that was circular, but nonetheless, you get the point, I'm here to help. Alrighty, um, have good days, one for each of you. I look forward to reading your responses. Take care.